Welcome to The Lead Sheet, inspiring conversations with extraordinary people. Here's your host, Drew Davison, with this week's guest, Glenn Kochi. Um, I want to just first start out by uh, welcoming uh, Glenn Kochi, uh, who is a marvelous, fantastic, internationally known uh, musician that we're really thrilled to have here on the, uh, the Memphis The Lead Sheet. Um, and so thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Certainly. Well, uh, I mentioned Yankee Hotel Foxtrot, uh, as I think Rolling Stone calls it one of the greatest rock and roll albums of all time. Uh, I want I want you to kind of talk us through, because am I correct that that was your first album as a member of Wilco? Yeah. In fact, they had already started the record. Um, but what, what really quick, what you were saying about, yeah, I, I mean, I remember when I first started getting in rock bands in the early 80s and thinking, you know, the music we were referencing seemed like it was from a, a completely different generation. And that was, you know, a shorter time gap than right now to Yankee Hotel Foxtrot, which is just mind blowing, you know, thinking covering Beatles songs, uh, you know, 20 years before that, they were just starting out. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty bizarre. But um, okay, with Yankee Hotel Foxtrot, yeah, I had um, met um, Jeff Tweedy, uh, the singer in Wilco, and we started collaborating um, with my good friend Jim O'Rourke, that's who I met Jeff through, um, in a band called Loose Fur. It was just kind of a little side project for fun. Um, and Jeff and I really hit it off and I recorded a soundtrack with him that he was working on for an Ethan Hawke film called um, Chelsea Walls. Okay. And we'd just been playing together and so he invited me to come into the studio and add some percussion to the new Wilco record that they'd been working on and demoing but it kind of um it was kind of uh you know and still still getting formulated what exactly it would be um there were different demos from different um uh sessions and there wasn't really any cohesion yet in the record so they were trying to finish that up in January of um, 2001 and that's when he invited me to come and play some percussion because they wanted to go in a different direction than had happened on previous Wilco records. Um, so I, I showed up to do that and, um, and it was a, quite a day because there was a film crew there doing a, a documentary on the band and I was immediately pulled aside and he asked me to join the band. <laughs> um, before I, I played a note and I was a little like, okay, let's take one thing at a time. Let's just like, let's see how this goes. And, you know, like, obviously I was overjoyed and, and well, like was, wow, is this real? But I, at the same time, um, respected the history and, um, and the previous drummer who's a, a monster drummer and wanted to make sure that I was, you know, honoring the legacy of the band too. So that's what happened. And we just started working on tunes and it really did click. And I was kind of bringing more of my approach that um, I'd been doing a lot of free improvising in the years prior to that. So using a lot of different extended techniques and really drawing upon my background as a classically trained percussionist um, and using a lot of different percussion instruments um, and world percussion instruments and you know found sound. So kind of bringing in my whole experience uh, to recording that record. That's why there's things like, you know, hubcaps on there, but also crotales and doombecks. So, you know, classical and, and ethnic percussion and found percussion, um, as well as drums. But, uh, yeah, so that's, that, that was my introduction to, to the band. So Glenn, before we transition to some other questions, uh, more specifically about, um, how you get inspired to make music. I'm really interested to learn a lot about that. Your comments about loving modern art. We've got to touch on that uh, for this show. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about my own personal questions about Yankee Hotel Foxtrot, being that it was your introduction uh, debut album uh, with a band. Um, there were some extraordinary things that happened in American history right at the same time. Um, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about the release of what must have been a pretty important time in your life to to be a the the drummer for this internationally known rock band um and then have this american history event happen right on top of it yeah so it's it's a pretty it was a pretty complex situation with the release of that album um you know i have to say before i get into it that i actually was afraid that people would hate this record um I dug it, but for me, it was such a departure from from like the record that everyone loved from Wilco, you know, being there 
which is, you know, a classic, and from the more pop stylings of, of uh, Summer Teeth, which was the previous, you know, full Wilco record. Um, I thought this one just went off, you know, into a different direction that I really loved, but I honestly thought the, the hardcore fans would be really upset and not like it. And I thought, you know, okay, I joined the band and I'm gonna kill this band now. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, you know, still kind of shocked that, you know, wow, it's, it really went the other way, which is cool. And now though, when I listen back to it, it's like, of course, yeah, it's a, it's a really good record. But um, so what happened is we started, we made the record. And I think because of the band's experience with that previous record, Summer Teeth, where they were asked by the label Warner Brothers to go ahead and and re-record some songs to make them a little more accessible, to make them a little more radio ready and make some changes here and there and bring in different producers to polish this up or fix that. They played ball with all that. They did what the label wanted and the label still really did not get behind the record at all. Um, you know, this is all secondhand because I wasn't in the band at that point, but it seemed like they felt a little bit burned. Like we did, we played game, you know, we played ball with you and, and then we didn't get uh, the, the support behind it that we were expecting. So this time it was, we handed in a completed record and it kind of got the same reaction. Like, no, we don't hear a single, we don't know, it's not quite right. Um, we need changes in the, you know, and the band just responded, no, this is the record. Um, mm. And so we were dropped then from Warner Brothers. Um, and we started to shop for a new label uh, and uh, came up in that time. We think we signed the deal already by then, but it was supposed to, the release date ahead of time was supposed to be September 11th. Um, and then we signed uh, with another arm of Warner Brothers, none such records. Um, they've always been a very forward thinking record label that, you know, encompassed a lot of not only, the, you know, original world music series, but also a lot of classical composers. Um, a lot of art music, but also, you know, rock and, and, and folk as well. So we signed with Nonesuch, also a Warner Brothers label. And um, and before that record came out, I'm not sure the exact timeline I have to remember, but we did have a tour booked for September. Um, and then September 11th happened. We went on tour a few weeks after that, and the record was not out, but we wanted to play these new songs and, and share it with our audience. Um, I think maybe we weren't even signed to none such at that point. And so that's when we streamed the record in the early days of streaming. We just put it on our website. 20 so we, years ago. Shows, yeah, 20 years ago. So we put it on the website um, so people could hear the record for free um, and have the record. So when we came to play these new songs at this tour in September of 2001, people would know the songs. And so that's what we did. We played it. We still signed the deal with Nonsuch and then it came out, I believe, later. You're going to have to fact check that. But my foggy memory from 20 years ago is, yeah, that's that's what happened. I'd like to transition a little bit to when you did the, the, the symposium for the Tennessee Music Educators with the Keeping the Beat. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, there were some really great statements that you made to teachers and I would like students to be able to unpack that as well. Uh, when asked about your hobbies and how those hobbies influenced your music making, you mentioned uh, your love for modern art and nature. Uh, can you go back and, and think about that question again and answer it for young people about specifically your source of inspiration as you're creating music? Where do you go to for sources of inspiration? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great question and it's... Uh... It's, you know, there's never one, one place I go for inspiration. You know, I kind of, um, I try and get in the practice of being creative. Um, I think I learned a while ago that if you wait for an epiphany and you wait for that aha moment, it's probably not going to come. And there's the best thing that I can possibly do is to get in the practice of being creative every day and uh, what I like to do is document that um, as well. So I try and get some work done, some writing done, or some creative thinking done every day. I document it all. And even though 95, 98% of it may not uh, stand up when I go back and look at it later, um, it's the idea of, of getting in the practice of it that lets the creativity flow. Um, and it keeps getting better and better. And so the ideas keep getting better and better because I'm in practice. It's like anything that you do. You know, the more you do it, the better you get at it. 
and and sometimes then I'll have this whole um, body of ideas, all these notebooks filled with ideas. And even if only two or three percent are good ideas, they're there when I'm feeling the inspiration or they resonate with me. I can go to those. Or if I get a commission or a project comes up, I have some good ideas already in place, maybe as building blocks or starting points. So that is always important for me. Now I do get you know a lot of uh, inspiration from external factors as well. And one is you mentioned nature. I just love uh, I love walking. I love hiking. Um, you know I love when I'm able to bike riding and kayaking and canoeing. I love all of those things, but especially hiking and walking. And when I'm on tour, that's my big thing. I always go on a long walk almost every day. Um, you know, instead of, um, you know, because the show is kind of my workout, um, you know, two, two and a half hours, I sweat constantly, you know, it may not be technically aerobic, but it's, it's pretty much a workout for me. So I, I don't go to a gym or go running beyond that, but I do like going on long walks and, and the inspiration, although sometimes it can come from things I see or hear or experience, I think it's more of that my mind is at rest when I'm in nature or when I'm walking or when I'm hiking, it's that I can't do work around the house or I can't return this email. I can't be on a device. I can't be reading something. I can't be, you know what I mean? Your mind is free to, to shut down and just think. And wow. I think that's the important time when ideas come to me. Um, when I, when I quiet down all the noise, um, and just experience live in the moment, of when I'm out in nature, when I'm hiking or walking, I'm in the moment and then the ideas can come to me and I, I hear them, you know what I mean? Because I'm not distracted doing 10 other things. So I think that's I probably- a question about that. Yeah. Do you think that because, I think about the, the past 20 years that you've been with Wilco and how many kids have grown up during that time and how the world has changed and yeah. to where there are devices everywhere uh, a good friend told me yesterday, we've got to get schools open back up because think of all the information that is not being disseminated to kids. We're going to fall behind. And I told him uh, that they, that's probably true. But if you think about the entire history of humanity for the last four months, young people have been tuned in consuming information at a rate that the world has never seen. It's just that it's up to the kids uh, on how they consume that, which is terrifying and, and inspiring at the same time. But it makes me wonder if those quiet moments that you uh, talk about um, seeking inspiration, it makes me wonder if young people aren't seeking that out because it's such a foreign thing to be unconnected. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, as a as a parent, I always worry about that, you know, and I and maybe, you know, I force my kids a little too much to, you know, limit screen time and to get them out there against their will um, and hike with me and, you know, get on the water, do something like that. Um, but you're right. I mean, it is, you know, kids have had access to far more um, information the last four months or three months than we did just on a typical summer vacation when we were kids. And I sound like an old man, but it's true because then we had three months just to occupy ourselves and figure out what to do with our time, you know, without devices. I mean, there was TV, of course, but um, no, I do, I do worry about that, especially, you know, now that, uh, you know, cell phones, kids are younger and younger getting cell phones or, or, you know, uh, Apple watches or Fitbits or whatever. There's always that, that um, pull there where they can check out what's going on and happening. But I think it's just, you know, everyone's going to learn a balance. Everyone has to learn to balance what's right for them. Um, I just try and watch it in my own family. I, I can't really, I don't know enough to, you know, to, uh, give recommendations to other people, but I think that silence is important. And you know what, honestly, you can find that silence too from, or a lot of times from reading or from experiencing other forms of art. And that's, you know, another, even though it's not, um, silence or shutting, shutting your, your thoughts down. Um, but, but I mentioned that I get a lot of inspiration, you know, when I'm on the road too, I love to go to museums, to art museums in particular, modern art museums. And I find that, you know, I get a lot of ideas for pieces, for writing, for beats, for things like that from modern art or sculpture, from literature, from other, other artistic mediums, from dance even. And it's more, uh, seeing these things, these mediums that are, far older than what I do. My instrument's only 100, 
hundred years old, 110 years old. Okay. It's, that's a baby in the history of time of, in the history of the arts. Um, so seeing how someone is reinventing, uh, painting in a certain way, this medium that's been around forever or dance or sculpture, or any, any of those things or literature, writing a novel in a completely different way. I really get off on that and see like, okay, they did this and they use this technique to, to make this incredible thing that I'm looking at. How would I do that as a drummer? or as a composer, how would I rethink what my instrument does or what I'm, what I normally do and try and rethink it to come up with different results. And that's, a you know, I've gotten a lot of pieces out of that just by asking questions like, how would I do that? How would I do that? How would I do that? Nice. So the, again, this is uh, Ty Boylan, Drew Davison here uh, with uh, Glenn Kochi. Uh, member of Wilco, uh, and I was going to say, what would you, how would you characterize the band Wilco? Uh, would you characterize them uh, as a rock band? And what does the, uh, what does the word uh, rock band mean to you? Wow, I've never been asked that. What does the word rock band mean to me? I always do say that rock band because, um, you know. It, Labels, musicians don't like labels in general, just because, especially now, um, so much music just crosses different boundaries and genres. Um, you know, it's almost a, we're in a state of post-genre music right now. Mm. But yeah, Wilco, you know, was labeled early on as an alt-country band or a country rock band, and then, um, you know, kind of more as a pop rock band, and then experimental and all these different titles get thrown at us. So I just like using rock, because if you go to a Wilco show, you're going to hear things that were influenced from, you know, from uh, country music, but you're also going to hear things that was that were influenced by German psych music or, you know, avant classical music or, um, you know, uh, post bebop jazz or, you know what I mean? Just because of the members, who we all are, what we listen to, what we do on our own, we bring all of that experience to the band and you can hear all these different influences seep in and when they're um, melded together with the rest of the band, they become something hopefully fresh and new. But it's it's a little too hard to describe all of those things and to say that, so I just say rock band. Now, what is a rock band? I mean, I just, you know, I mean, the instrumentation I think says a lot, you know, guitars, drums, bass, keyboards, and vocals. So to me, that's kind of standard rock band instrumentation. And, you know, we're definitely steeped in, um, I guess the songs at their core, you know, Jeff Tweedy's songwriting um, is based in folk music at its core. Um, that the rich history of folk music from from different cultures that arose in America, and that's what created, you know, all of our great art forms um, mm. that branched out. You know, from from R and B to jazz to to rock, rockabilly, country, everything. Um, in there. So um, at the core, I think that there's a nugget of uh, folk songs in all of our songs, and then we kind of dress them up in all these different and unique ways. You know, I think I think that's really interesting, uh, Glenn, because in my classroom, we've actually talked about uh, what defines a genre. And mm -hmm. I played a song by Johnny Gill called My, 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 and then I played a song um, by Jason Aldean, Tonight Looks Good on You. And we discussed the topic of the song of both of those songs were a man really saying to his woman that you look beautiful tonight. So <laughs> they define one as a country song and one as an R&B song. So if they're talking about the same content, then what makes them the genre that they are? So uh, we came to the same uh, conclusion that instrumentation really does have a lot to do with it. What type of instruments are you using uh, and I think that has a lot more to do with how you define a genre as opposed to what you're singing about or what you're rapping about. Definitely. I agree wholeheartedly. There's so many songs that could easily be, uh, you know, a, it's, I mean, they're great rock songs, but if you put a pedal steel and a fiddle on them, now they're ready for country radio or, you know, vice versa. If you put a drum machine instead of a, a, a drum part, you know, I mean, it just, the way that you arrange it, depends on where what radio stations will play it and which ones won't basically yeah well and i think that the reason that students may be particularly in the 901 area code here in tennessee with memphis uh interested in the semantics of what is music and what is rock what is rock and roll is 
because of the the great history that Memphis has had of the studios that have been here, you can go in one part of town and have the the Stax label with American Soul Music and that entire catalog. You've got American Sound Studios, which you know the Neil Diamond, uh, D- Dusty Springfield, uh, and you know you can't forget about Sun Records, uh, where the rockabilly. Uh, help define a type of what is what is this rock and roll going to be um, mm-hmm. and so there's such a rich diversity of flavors just in this city uh, not even to think about everything that has taken place in the last 30 years and the the cultivation of, of hip-hop around the country how it's been kind of um, spearheaded in, in a large regard here in the 901 so I think young people really need to pay attention that not all cities have that rich, diverse uh, genres of, of cultivated music. Um, and that kind of brings me to my next question for you, Glenn, is uh, do you have any cool Memphis stories? I know y'all have uh, played here a lot. Um, uh, do you, you remember anything from some of the shows here? Um, I, I remember the first time I heard y'all play live was right after the Avett Brothers at Bill Street Music Festival. Uh, the rain had just poured the day before, so there were people running and doing slip and slides in the mud during the concert. It was a pretty wild night. Um, and I remember that night y'all ended with uh, big stars uh, in the street and Jody Stevens uh, played um, on the final there. So, uh, do you have any recall any Memphis stories uh, uh, or um, anything you'd like to talk about there? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, Memphis is it's a, a true gem, and you know there really aren't many other cities at all, any other cities like like Memphis um, that's got that rich history of so many different styles of music and so much incredible music has come out of that city. It's it's remarkable. Um, I feel like it almost doesn't get the, the credit it deserves either. You know what I mean? People always think about the sessions in LA or, or you know, the studios in LA or, or Nashville or New York and, you know, of course, Chicago. But Memphis, I always think it's overlooked. When you look at what's come out of there for the size of city it is, it's, it's mind blowing. But yeah, we always love playing Memphis. Um, we played there a bunch. I do have some, I remember the concert you're talking about, I remember. Um, also, I remember once playing on top of the Gibson factory doing something and it was freezing cold. I remember that barely being able to move my arms. But my, I'm honestly like my favorite memories are always Jody Stevens from Big Star. And Big Star is such an important band for all of us in Wilco. Um, you know, it just kind of ties together. I mean, not to try and, uh, you know, to minimize what what they did, but for me, it ties together like where the Beatles and the Replacements they're they're what's in between. You know, they're they're that from from you know pop crafting, beautiful uh, lyricism, songwriting to this kind of rough and tumble, let it all hang out, just go you know kind of crazy. They're they they have both of that in there, and they're such a uh, incredible band. So for me, every time we're there, almost every time Jody Stevens, who's one of my drumming heroes too, he's just got such a beautiful style, um, sits in with Wilco. Um, he's been friends with the band, you know, before I was around. And so he's always sits in on one or two tunes, which I love. And that's always fantastic. But also, you know, for me, I think the last time we were there, we actually recorded at Ardent Studios, which is, you know, one of the other classic studios there, um, you know, just uh, unbelievable the stuff that's come out of there uh so that was a thrill and i actually got to play jody stevens drums um that was that was wonderful for me but honestly also just going to the Stax museum um al jackson jr is one of my my heroes um that music has had a huge impact on me um i love a lot of different types of uh soul music you know i, lo- I love what came out of high records in Memphis too and Motown, but for some reason Stax just had this edge, uh, this roughness to it um, without all the, you know, syrupy strings. And uh, I don't know, there's just something about it, a little more gritty, a little more honest, something that speaks to me a lot. I even wrote a, um, uh, a classical piece for the Bang on a Can All-Stars, uh, the new music group out of, out of New York. 
And um, when they commissioned me to write a piece for them, I wrote uh, a 10 minute piece called Snap based off the, you know, the logo, the Stacks logo, where I took, you know, the, the first beginning of Eddie Floyd's knock on wood, the ch -ch 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 -ch, and I, I, I did a, a hock it off of that, um, phased it rhythmically. And I think it was, it was a, I'm forgetting which Booker T and the MGs song time is tight maybe a beautiful chord progression i took that in retrograde and made a piano part from that and the whole thing came off of that but it's you know it's it's a classical piece um but there is drum set on it but it's all based off the the, uh, the energy and the spirit behind the, the stacks music but i mean it's such a rich you know johnny cash all this came from there too like you know all the al green stuff that came out it's just yeah so ty it sounds like glenn has outlined our next four uh, radio shows uh I would love to have that piece that uh, that you commissioned, the classical piece, um, and we could play that from start to finish. Does that sound good, Ty? Absolutely. And I it, don't uh, know that it's ever been recorded. Oh, really? <laughs> well, we... yeah, there might be a live version of it, but if I remember correctly, the live version of it, the the um, they had a substitute piano player that day, and it is a monster piano part. They're jumping, you know, all over the place. It's kind of based around that piano part, and I. I think, I'm pretty sure I have a live recording of it, but the piano part was pretty much um, butchered. So I'll have to listen back to that and see if I even care at this point. You know? <laughs> well, we, at, at some point, uh, if, uh, if, if there's not a great recording of it, we may be able to partner with some of our uh, University of Memphis uh, and other colleagues. I'd love to get a, a, a live recording played for our young people here in Memphis. Um, and Ty, let's also yeah. try to get Jody uh, Stevens from Ardent to uh, to be one of our upcoming guests. I'd love to hear some he of those expanded stories. Sweet, so, sweet man, down to earth, you know. So, so that inspired me um, to ask a curveball question. Sam Cooke was once asked if there was a song out there that he wished that he wrote, what song would that be? And he said, blowing in the wind. Oh. He said every time that he heard that song, he knew that that was the message that he wanted to uh, to sing about, that he wanted to talk about. And that subsequently inspired a change that's going to come. So if there was a song that's ever been released that you feel would have been perfect for Wilco, what song would that be? Wow. That might be the toughest question I've ever gotten. <laughs> that would be perfect for Wilco because I'm sure everyone in the band would be, give a completely different answer. Um, and there's so many different things we do. Wow. Well, and I think it's also cool that almost every one of your live shows, y'all, y'all end with something fantastic that is. Um, special to that city just like you mentioned with in the street when you come to memphis i was just in chicago in december right before the pandemic and um y'all i think y'all had like four or five shows in a row at the chicago theater yeah um, and you know when you end with something uh different every night you know, lending your voice to to other bands uh wilco does a lot of music that uh, not necessarily covers, but uh, music honoring and amplifying voices of, 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 of other artists, which I think is really cool. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, you know what? That's, Ty, that's such an amazing question. I'm, and I'm trying to think too, because we do cover bands. And, I, and you know, a few years ago at our festival, we actually did an all request cover set. Um, and my, <sighs> This is going to be interesting because I, I might even go with, I bet the other guys would totally disagree, but I might go with Marquee Moon by television. Just because when we covered that song, it seemed perfect because it's got the long groove. Um, Jeff's voice was suited for it, but more the, the guitar attack, because we've got three monster guitar players in our band. And all the guitar interplay that happens on that song, um, it just seemed like, the band really came alive like that was a super huge challenge for us to learn it and to get it going um but it also seemed like yes this makes perfect sense for us to be playing this right now it's such a it's such a great song um yeah so i'm i'm just gonna have i'm gonna have to go with marquee moon by television 
it seems like that would be this you know it's very you know maybe right for us because we've all listened to it so much and been so influenced by it but yeah well uh we're coming up to uh to getting close to the hour which is really sad for me because i have so many more uh notes here for questions well, um, <laughs> i want to um to introduce young people in the city of memphis uh, some, introduced to some uh, about the idea of a Fulbright scholarship. And I know that your wife is a scholar an uh, engineer and so many great things uh, doing, doing great work. And so I want to bring her in in a minute if we can. But before yeah. we do, one question about Tiny Desk Concert. Oh, yes, sir. One thing I forgot to say too, that's really important about like when I was thinking about Stacks um, and what, what we started the whole conversation off with, you know, Booker T and the MGs, that just, you know, having, white and black musicians at an early time like that playing together with you know when I think it was still pretty when they started there was still segregation going on in Memphis um you know it's just mind-blowing it seems so natural and such a perfect perfect band for me um everything about that band but uh, but they must have been one of the early rock bands at least, or soul bands, or whatever you want to call them, because they're kind of everything. And they played on all those hits. They backed up all that stuff. And I think that's a true, um, that's another beautiful thing about Memphis, is you have that core behind all those hits, all those songs on stacks, is that multiracial backing band. Um, I think that's pretty special too. And especially for that time, that was awfully forward thinking of the, uh, you know, everyone at stacks. And yeah, anyway. Makes me wonder what forward thinking means today. No, like it's it, not forward thinking, not even forward thinking. It should have been, you know. Yeah, it, it was forward thinking for sure. And it makes me wonder like what- Sadly, it was forward thinking, yeah. And, and it makes me wonder like if everybody that cares about this work uh, was really thinking about 2040, what would we be doing right now uh, for sure? Yeah. So in our, final moments here before we bring in uh, your your wife. Mm -hmm. I want to ask about um, the National Public Radio, Radio has this great series, Tiny Desk Concert. Mm -hmm. And um, I know y'all have done that several times. And my question, uh, I just listened two or three times uh, to the one that y'all did promoting A Whole Love. And okay. um, I think it was around 10 years ago, but it's the first time I actually watched it. And there's a moment where you're playing on the desk. And I don't know if you remember that experience, but your drum set was essentially a hodgepodge of anything you would find in a regular office. Mm -hmm. uh, and at, at that moment, every person can visualize themselves, whether it's a student at a desk who's tapping on their desk, turning their desk into uh, you know, a drum set with just a bunch of cool guys uh, jamming and making music. It's it's a great 20 minute video. And Ty, we're going to uh, to put on that show a contrast of a tune called War on War. And uh, it's the final tune that they did. And that's from Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. Is that right? Uh, so, so that was already in the works for 10 years. And that video was 10 years ago, 20 years, uh, according to my genius math. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the question that I have is, um, after listening to that set, I thought, you know, that's a great song. That's a great song. That's a great song. But none of them would have been in my top like 20 Wilco songs. And so when y'all are choosing what to do on something that you know is going to get a lot of people that, that may not be familiar with Wilco, uh, how do y'all determine what the set list is going to be to introduce your music to people that may not have heard it? I'm not sure, <laughs> actually. You know, the last uh, 10 or so years, Jeff pretty much has come up with the set lists. Um, I gave up at a certain point just because it is, a lot of it does come down to, at least for live shows, um, you know, what what key is this in or what guitar do I use on this and we have to switch to this other guitar and then this or can Nell switch to that guitar in time? And there's just a lot of technical stuff that might go into it. but. Typically, yeah, there's songs that may be the single off of a record that barely get played in our live shows, and there's deeper cuts that get played all the time. And I think a lot of that is just, it's a trial and error over time, playing songs, some of them 
fall flat. And some of them people really respond to, even if it's a deeper cut. So we tend to play those more. And then also at any given show, it's, you know, we're gonna play some things off whatever the most recent record is. We're also gonna play some things that we know the audience wants to hear. And then we let people vote in every night too with requests of so of our songs and we factor that in too. So, you know, on any given night, there's gonna be a third that are gonna be wild cards, a third that you can kind of know we're gonna play and then a third that would be from new songs. But for something like the Tiny Desk concert, um, that's a good question. I don't know. It was probably just like, hey, do we feel like doing this? Or it might be more like, what can we do with these? You know, they each got one guitar and those guys, use a lot of gear <laughs> and you know there's a lot of keyboards a lot of guitar changing going on so it might just be more like okay what can we do on this something from the new record something that people want to hear it's probably the same mentality behind it but also then within the you know the um restrictions of of with this gear now that doesn't always factor with me because like you said i was playing a desk and i have to talk about that for a second it, you know for me the world is a drum and that's one of the beautiful things about percussion is that you know it is kind of everything that isn't something else so if it's not someone singing or it's not a, a string instrument or a brass or a woodwind instrument it's a percussion instrument basically and that's historically been the case through classical percussion in orchestras when a composer wanted a unique sound or texture or color and wrote for it, then they would just throw it in the percussion section because obviously you're not gonna ask a violin player to play a wind machine or a starter pistol or to do cannon shots or you know whatever, playing an anvil, all these different sounds that were you know, unheard of at the time and were introduced to orchestras. And that's continued throughout you know, the um, creation of my instrument, the drum set, and when that first was created a hundred years ago, drummers were playing in these theater setups and vaudeville setups. So drummers were the guy who not only played with the band and provided rhythm, but also was the person who had to take the comedian who came out then and do their cues or play behind the tap dancer or you know, the, the, the dancer, the comedian, the magician and had to do those accents and stuff or had to, you know, so they were using, we were using all different types of sounds um, and for different effects. You know, Max Roach, uh, legendary Max Roach, called called the drum set the original multicultural, multi-percussion instrument. And it's true because we've got drums from, you know, Western military drums from Europe, drums from Africa, cymbals from Turkey and China, um, percussion from, from South America and Africa, from everywhere. And it's this kit, you know, it's a beautiful collection of instruments. And, and so drum set players and drummers like me still think that way and i have as much fun finding sounds in a hardware store or a kitchen store as i do in a music store because if it makes a good sound and it can be you know somehow utilized you know whether it's a flower pot or or uh, or food, water faucets or faucet yeah anything <laughs> it can be it can be percussion and so that's why you know the thought of okay i don't have any drums here i've just got some sticks and brushes what's around no problem that'll make a sound that'll make a sound a thing full of paper clips great a tea you know a, a coffee cup great all these things you know cardboard to play brushes on so um it's you know that openness uh can spark a lot of creativity too and it's just fun very cool well ty i hope that uh that you'll be able to find that clip that i sent uh with the uh I think it was Delta faucets. Uh, there was a faucet yeah. company that you did that great commercial for, uh, and that clip is cool. But I want to know: Have you ever seen the the clips that someone did where they inserted? Uh, it's like a bunch of teenage boys insert yeah, I, like weird, strange noise on top of it, and I didn't know my that existed. Teenager came alive with that. <laughs> yeah, I had a reference at one time, and I looked up, and I was like, "What's this? It's got more views than the commercial does." And I was like, <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you can thank teenagers for that, I'm sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I should tell that to my kids. They'd probably like that better than the original one. But they're well, still. I, I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time here. We're yeah. coming up close. And I, and I would like to. I've got a question uh, for both you and your wife. Uh, okay. and, and then specifically for her, if you still had a couple of minutes for us. Sure. Let me, let me go grab her one moment. Perfect. 
All right, so uh, here we are again on the lead sheet uh, featuring the Kochi family uh, in uh, in Chicago. Uh, and we really enjoyed our conversation with Glenn and we're gonna return uh, with some final questions for him. Uh, but Professor uh, Kochi uh, with us uh, is um, traveled the world recently on a Fulbright fellowship. Um, and I would first would like to know uh, your kids, what do they think you do? Are you a teacher to them? Are you an engineer? What did your children think you do? Uh, that's a great question. They know, um, I think they think I might be a, a physician because they know I have a doctorate. So they've heard people refer to me as Dr. Kochi. So I've had to tell, tell them a couple of times I'm not that kind of doctor. Um, I think they know that I teach. I've, they've come to my office and they've seen met some of my students. So they know I teach and they, and they uh, vaguely something related to medical, the medical world. Well, and um, I want to know a little bit about the Fulbright opportunity that you had. Um, and can you tell young people in Memphis, what is the Fulbright Fellowship? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm glad you asked because so um, because I was part of the um, the Fulbright Scholars, which is um, an opportunity for um, researchers and professionals and um, generally faculty to conduct research um, abroad. And really, the aim was um, developed from uh, former Senator Fulbright, who wanted to have a um, a diplomatic way of exchange in hoping to. Um, work together with other countries peacefully. Mm. Um, but there's also, um, I think, a much bigger program that's actually um, for Fulbright students. And that is an opportunity for students to um, go all over the world to 100 plus different countries um, to teach English, to um, teach, you know, in, in an area that they studied in college. And so, um, and those can be three to six month uh, re uh, exchanges as well. So there's a lot of opportunity for students, um, college students to um, go abroad as well. Well, I hope that there's someone listening uh, that is a student in one of our schools that will do a web search on those opportunities and start planning out their own lead sheets and plan to do something like that, prepare their lives to be in a position that when it's time to be considered for an honor like that, that they have the readiness to do that. Um, so you you did your work in Finland, and it's I'm curious to know what did you learn about the Finnish people, if I'm saying that correctly, the the people from Finland, uh, from the perception of innovation. What did you learn about their perspectives on innovation that you feel like those in the United States needs to uh, to learn? That, it was actually pretty interesting because um, I think their identity, of course, is formed through their history. And they are a country that has, you know, a thousand miles of borderline with Russia. So they, um, and they were part of Sweden for hundreds of years. So I think even though they're an independent country now, they've only just celebrated their 100 year um, independence and they've had a they've had their own unique identity for for far longer than that but because they were um, um, parts of other countries for a long time I think they really have had to always collaborate and work together um, with their um, with with other people other Finnish people tightly and so I think that's part of who they are now and so when I was asking them about collaborating and how do you work so easily with you know, business people and medical people and people you don't really, you know, you don't know what their their expertise is. How do you guys all come together so well? And they they almost seemed like that's that's just what we do, <laughs> you know. Um, and that's really what I was interested in learning learning about. So that was that was that was interesting. Do you feel like there's potential here in the United States to adopt that same level of uh, curiosity with? Uh, with people that are unlike uh, ourselves in order to uh, better collaborate? Do you feel like we've got a uh, hope to do that? Are we on the cusp of something uh, able to, to leverage some of their expertise in that? For sure. I think there's always opportunity and there's always room for growth and room to work together with people um, of different identities and um, people that are coming from different perspectives to make um, the outcome stronger than if it was just one one viewpoint. 
Well, uh, uh, Dr. Kochi and uh, and Glenn, we we want to respect your time and thank you so much for what y'all have done. We have, I have another question to wrap things up. Ty, do you also have uh, do you have any other questions before we we wrap things up? No, I just want to go back to a uh, to a point that Glenn made prior that I think will be very beneficial to our kids that are going to be watching uh, about creativity. You know, there are a lot of times where I see kids, they're writing songs or they're writing poems and then they'll take it and they'll ball it up and they'll throw it in the trash can because at that time they're not really feeling uh, what they're writing. But I would contend that they keep those because there will always be times to where they can circle back and reattach themselves to whatever it is that um, was on their mind. I feel like if you manifest it from your mind, it's for a reason. Um, and your art is valuable and it doesn't belong in the trash can. So that was that was a great point. I yeah, definitely. I know a lot of songwriters who, you know, gotten great results, songs of ideas that were just kicking around from years ago that never quite uh, resonated enough to pursue. And then they've, they've come back to them, you know, at different points in their life and finally, you know, gotten a great song out of it at some point. Same thing with classical pieces. Uh, but I know that y'all both have uh, y'all y'all have children that have been experiencing working at home, learning from home, uh, and being involved in the institution that you're you're with. Lots of COVID-related changes. I wonder what you think about a way that we educate young people, knowing what we know now. Um, what do you think our institutions need to be prioritizing um, differently? Like, uh, Glenn, for you, I think about music, um, the music that you learned in classical training uh, with music performance degree. Um, if you had it all to do over again, what should music teachers be focusing on uh, to help all kids learn? And uh, from an institutional uh, perspective, Dr. Kochi, uh, what should our higher ed institutions be prioritizing uh, keeping in mind everything that's going on in the world right now, what would you like to see them prioritize? Uh, well, for me, first, I would just say um, I would I would want to study things with a more inclusive mindset, and I would want my teachers to do that. I did have some teachers who were that way, which was great, but instead of thinking like, oh, you know, this is marimba, and I'm going to learn it for this marimba piece, or this technique is only done in marching percussion or only in classical percussion or you only do this in here it's like no you can learn from that cross pollination that cross disciplinary exchange you learn a lot from and that can really push boundaries and uh benefit any student i think so i would i would want to have more of that as part of my curriculum as a student or as a teacher um in music at the end. That's perfect. And and what about that same question for our higher education institutions? If you could wave a magic wand and uh, all of a sudden make all the provosts across the country prioritize a, a particular direction, where do you think we should be heading? Um, well, I, I, I have two things that come to mind. So one of them, I mean, I'm coming from a st you know, STEM field, so the hard sciences, and I'm thinking a lot about diversity and representation, and we need to work on that a lot, especially in the STEM fields. So that's one thing at, at the higher ed level. Um, and then, you know, also in engineering, the other thing that I, that I think about is, I think um, in the STEM fields in general, people forget that there's a lot of creativity. And when you, when you get really deep into it, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of imagination and creativity in creating new things, whether it's art, uh, music, um, architecture or science and so I, I want kids to know that it's all it's all connected you know and mm -hmm. you can be a creative independent thinker um, in any field that you that you move into well that's perfect uh, and on behalf of Ty uh, Rachel and our dear friend uh, Tom who's not able to be with us today uh, we we appreciate y'all so much for carving out some time for the young people of Shelby County and uh, Memphis City uh, schools. And um, anytime y'all are in Memphis, you have an open invitation. We'd love to uh, sit down and, and have a meal with you uh, at some point. Uh, great days ahead. Thank y'all so very much. Thank you. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Delta Touch Duo technology for your kitchen and bathroom. Precisely in tune with every touch. See what Delta can do.